I'm here on Seminary Ridge at Gettysburg. This is such an amazing site. It's so well preserved. I'm walking along the Confederate gun line. This was a momentous place. This was a place of glory. This was a place of great suffering. And we know that the Battle of Gettysburg is so important in the American mythos. We have built it up, not just for strategic importance, which is up for debate, but also for the emotion behind the Battle of Gettysburg. And there are so many meaningful vignettes from Gettysburg, but I'd like to share one of the sillier ones, because this was not just something that was um, being decided at Gettysburg for Americans. This was not just something that only Americans cared about. There were foreign observers here at Gettysburg and there were many people, millions of people in their homes all over the world wondering what was to become of America. We're here on Seminary Ridge where you see the Confederate gun line and on the third day they would have been firing um, over against Cemetery Ridge but you can see the, the obelisk and the, the Pennsylvania Monument over there. Some of those questions that had to be decided were whether free and undivided republic would survive, whether the American influence would last independently in the Americas, whether slavery would survive. Of course, Britain freed the slaves in 1833 and had worked on the process of ridding slavery from the empire and they had worked closely with the Americans to actually eradicate the transatlantic slave trade. Britain had aggressively pursued uh, abolition treaties throughout the world, and yet slavery survived in America and in Brazil. There was great interest not only in the outcome of the American Civil War, but the manner in which it was fought. Uh, there was great public interest in the Crimean War, and that still captures our imagination today with the Charge of the Light Brigade. There was great interest in the Italian Wars of Independence and the, the Great Battle of Soverino, where the, the French bested the Austrians and laid the path for Italian unification. And so, many different European observers, particularly those with military interests, made their way over to um, the Civil War, and some of which um, actually participated, <laughs> and some of which were uh, neutral observers. And those are the people I'd like to talk about today, and we also... I'm on a carriageway, so forgive the, the carriages. There were a great many foreigners that came over and participated in the American Civil War, um, but there were also many who, as neutral observers and neutral has to be taken with a grain of salt, um, came over to observe the war. Many people ask me about Colonel Fremantle, because um, I've seen him portrayed in his red tunic in the um, movie Gettysburg. And the real story behind him is absolutely fascinating. He was a lieutenant colonel at the time and was in... Uh, the Coldstream Guards, one of the most prestigious regiments in the British Army. His father was actually a general. So Fremantle was stationed in Gibraltar. And in 1862, the CSS Sumter came in for repairs uh, and possibly looking to pursue their raiding into the Mediterranean. And the British and Ottoman opinions on that pursuit are a story for a different day. But the um, captain... Raphael Semmes befriended uh, Colonel Fremantle, and he started to actually realize that he could travel to the Americas to observe this civil war, because it was absolutely fascinating. People were following the war in the papers. They were very interested 
in these uh, in the goings on, and possibly it might be of of military significance. Um, we know the Americans sent observers over to the Crimean War. Um, there were British observers um, with the Italians in in 1859. And that's when Fremantle decided that he might try to observe the Civil War from the southern side. And I guess I need to address uh, British sympathies with the South, because there were many people, particularly in the upper classes, that sided with the South, at least initially, because they saw it as the, the chivalrous, the traditional, the, the agrarian underdog. Um, whereas many people, particularly those in the working classes, saw it as a a quest to end slavery. I mean, we, you can see the writings during the the Lancashire cotton famine in Manchester, where you know they thought they were doing their part to um, contribute to the death of slavery. So anyway, Fremantle goes to uh, Matamoros, Mexico, because he needs to find a legal way to enter. The Confederacy, and obviously the North is not going to let him enter the Confederacy legally, um, nor is he um, liable to risk running the blockade, because that would also be illegal. So he is transported to Matamoros and crosses the border into Texas and into the Confederacy that way. And that's one of the most interesting things about Fremantle, is he actually gets a vignette of the entire Confederacy. He sees the Desperados in uh, Texas, and he sees the, the gentleman in Virginia. So um, that's, that's one of the most interesting things about Three Months in the Southern States, which is his book, um, which I, I encourage many people to read, um, which does have to be taken with a massive grain of salt, um, because he befriends a lot of these Confederates and does not really have a great experience um, in the North. So it's understandable that he has a, a particular perspective that might not necessarily be unbiased. So Fremantle continues on his way throughout the Confederacy, uh, visits you know, a lot of the key figures in the Confederacy. He um, eventually goes to Richmond, meets Jefferson Davis, meets a lot of the cabinet members, obtains a pass, and then goes up um, with Lee's army and finally catches up with everyone near Chambersburg. And at the Franklin Hotel in Chambersburg, and I was looking to see whether the Franklin Hotel was still around, um, but apparently it burned down in 1864, so I'm a bit late he met three other observers. And the first of which is uh, uh, Francis Lawley, who was the um, reporter for the Times who replaced William Howard Russell. William Howard Russell did not have a great time when he was in, um, in, the, uh, in the Americas, first reporting from the North and then reporting from the South. Um, but Francis Lawley, and then there was Justus Scheibert, who was um, a major in the Prussian engineers. And then last is Fitzgerald Ross, who is an Englishman, but he's in Austrian service. He's been 10 years in the Hungarian Hussars. And my favorite thing about him is he insisted on wearing his um, Hussars uniform, which is obnoxious with its big gold braids and... Uh, um, he might have got away with it, with it being very similar to, to Cadet Gray. But Fremantle advised him not to because he said, In the evening I called again to see Lolly, and found in his room an Austrian officer in the full uniform of the Hungarian Hussars. He had got a year's leave of absence, and has just succeeded in crossing the Potomac, though not without much difficulty. When he stated his intention of wearing his uniform, I explained to him the invariable custom of the Confederate soldiers of never allowing the smallest peculiarity of dress or appearance to pass without a torrent of jokes, which, however good-humoured, ended in becoming rather monotonous. And so you can see that uh, maybe some Confederates made fun of him and his peculiarities, as it were. Um, he had a few different peculiarities aside from his speech. He apparently um, had a gray shooting suit, which is very similar to the Norfolk jacket um, of today. And he uh, carried a Turkish lantern with him, 
which we've talked about in our uh, Crimean War exploits, was the uh, the folding linen uh, and brass travel lantern, and it said it gave off a ghostly glow in the camp. Uh, it would have been the the one that Florence Nightingale would have would have carried. So they eventually catch up with Longstreet's headquarters, and they observe a lot of the goings on of the first two days of Gettysburg. Scheibert and Fremantle apparently climbed a tree together to see what they could see. I would have liked to have seen that. Um, and on the third day, one of the most ridiculous things happens, and this is my favorite, because I, I talk about um, you know the inaccuracies of Gettysburg, because we know that uh, Fremantle wouldn't have worn his red tunic. He would have worn civilian clothes. Um, not only because he didn't want to be ostentatious, but because you wouldn't want to have been seen formally supporting um, the Confederacy wearing the uniform in your official capacity. Um, so there would have been a little tact there required. And I also talk about how, you know, this 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 guy was a colonel in in the Coldstream Guards. He wouldn't have been a, a really silly figure. And then and then I tell this story. And all of that kind of goes out the window. So on the third day, Fitzgerald, Ross, and Fremantle are walking along Seminary Ridge, and Longstreet's men are formed. The artillery has been massed, and there's been an artillery barrage in both directions. They think that there's not much going on, and they actually go off towards the town in that direction to see if they could see something. They try to go up the cupola um, at the seminary to see if there's something interesting that can be observed. Um, and they actually come back just as the attack has already been repulsed. And he goes up to uh, Longstreet somewhere near here and says, I wouldn't have missed this for the world. And uh, Longstreet says, the devil, you wouldn't. I should have liked to miss it very much. We've attacked and been repulsed. So that would have been kind of an awkward encounter, I think. Um, Fremantle thinking that the attack hadn't begun yet, but um, it actually had already been repulsed. He saw a few regiments forming in those woods to the rear and thought that uh, that was the attack forming. Longstreet asks for a drink, and Fremantle actually offers him his silver flask as a gift, as a token of his his esteem, and Longstreet apparently accepts it. They, they got along very well by all accounts. It's just this was a kind of an awkward encounter. The other funny thing is that somewhere near here, now these are, these are all younger trees. They weren't witness trees, as they're called. But somewhere, um, just as Scheibert, our Prussian, found a tree, climbed up it, um, and um, observed the attack on Cemetery Ridge. And Francis Lawley was with him, but at the bottom of the tree. And here's this Prussian yelling down observations in his thick Prussian accent, but he was using only military terminology. And we don't know what exactly it was, but I'm sure he was yelling about infilad fire and moving at the oblique and all these different terms that Lolly didn't didn't understand. And so Lolly's yelling up to him uh, you know, if he could use layman's terms. And there's this Prussian uh, yelling down at him in his uh, esoteric Prussian accent. Um, I think that would have been absolutely hilarious to see. So there's two frustrating things going on with the with the observers here at Gettysburg. They all published things um, that we can read today, all four of them. Lolly, of course, writing for the Times. Um, the Times was very important at the time. The, the British press, it, the Times was the most important uh, paper, arguably, in the British press. And the British press was arguably the most important of the international uh, presses. Um, uh, Justice Scheibert wrote a book called uh, Seven Months in the Rebel States During the Northern American War. Uh, quite, a, quite a title. And he, uh, he writes 
his comments are are interesting uh, because they 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 talk about how um, he was wondering why they're they're um, particularly at Gettysburg. He was wondering why the the cannonade was not accompanied by musketry of any kind. Um, he makes little observations here and there. Um, very, uh, he has a lot of biases in his writing as well. Um, Fitzgerald Ross wrote a book called Towns, Cities and, Ta Cities and Camps of the Confederate States. His is mostly about domestic life in the Civil War or in the, on the Confederate side. And his is also kind of an interesting read. Has to be taken with a massive brick of salt. Um, three months in the southern states, though, and to a lesser extent, uh, Scheibert's book, are important because of what they're missing. Um, oftentimes, people look at the American Civil War and don't think about the rest of the world at the time. And although the military maneuvers are important to us, there, in, in a lot of professional military circles, there was not a lot to be learned from two volunteer armies slogging away at each other. Um, there were not a lot of um, technologies being used in new ways. Of course, there were repeaters. Of course, there were... Um, the Americans used their cavalry in a very unique way, and Fremantle comments about that. Um, he doesn't like it, but he calls it unique. Um... But for the American-centric worldview, that's very, that's very shocking. But um, in both of these books, a lot of the things that they don't say speak volumes. They're not talking about how brilliant a lot of the maneuvers are. They're not commenting on the use of musketry. They're, they're talking about, you know, how they close the distance with the bayonet. And, of course, they're very, you know, they're, they have high morale and they're very fearsome um, in their experience. But there's, there's not a lot that um, there's not a lot of interesting things that they might be, be writing on that are new or innovative um, that, you know, you might have seen um, in, a, in a European war. Of course, the quote attributed to Moltke is that the, the American Civil War is two armed mobs. And, and that, that feeling, you can tell it's sort of there in a lot of this writing. Here's two professional soldiers writing about, you know, the biggest war in their lifetime, and there, there's not a lot for them to say from a professional military standpoint. These are professionals, an engineer officer in the Prussian army, a lieutenant colonel of an infantry regiment would have been very experienced, um, and yet there's, there's not a lot of, a lot of talk there. So another thing I want to talk about is Fremantle's experience after the battle. He follows Lee's army on the retreat, but then decides to go back into Union lines to try to get home. He's wearing a gray shooting suit and manages to trade his coat, but he's still got gray trousers on. That is commented on. He's immediately denounced as a spy. Manages to actually show his papers that, that say that he's a neutral observer and uh, manages to get out of a, a pickle there. Um, but then he travels to New York during the draft riots <laughs> where um, Northerners are actively attempting to lynch African-Americans. There are, uh, there's just horrible violence and racism in New York. And we have accounts even from Fremantle that Northern mobs uh, stole onto British ships to attack black sailors. And a lot of these British merchant ships, because the Royal Navy wasn't there, requested support from the French Navy. And here are these uh, ships with black sailors needing to anchor themselves under the guns of a French frigate in New York. That is not a great experience for someone that, that might need to decide, hey, is this actually about slavery? Um, um, you know, and he's been getting the narrative the whole time that, Oh yeah, maybe the Confederates might might free their slaves. Maybe um, um, this isn't truly about slavery in any way. Um, and so he has a very poor experience. But then goes aboard the steamship China, 
and makes his way back to Britain. And he almost immediately publishes a lot of his diary in Blackwood's magazine, and then it's put out in a standalone book. Um, three months in the southern states, of course. It's fascinating to look at all of their stories and, and go back and, and read these accounts. But we know the eyes of the world were upon this place. And they wanted not only to see the outcome, but to see um, the manner in which this war was fought. So that's the story of the foreign observers here at Gettysburg. We know this is a momentous place. The site of Longstreet's assault against Cemetery Ridge, of Pickett's charge, of the high watermark of the Confederacy. But it's also the place where a Prussian climbed up a tree and where an Englishman was a little bit late to the party.